0 for 6 on the power play and two power play goals allowed, any other numbers you hear in reaction to game one do not matter. We recap what happened in game one, including some loss of composure for the Wild down the stretch on today's episode of Locked on Wild. You're locked on Wild. Your daily podcast on the Minnesota Wild. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Welcome to another episode of Locked On Wild, your daily Minnesota Wild podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Thank you for making Locked on Wild your first listen each and every day. And just as a reminder, Locked on Wild is free and available wherever you listen to podcasts. On today's episode of Locked on Wild, we recap a game one loss for the Wild 4-0 to the St. Louis Blues. We talk about atrocious special teams play. But we talk about the more frustrating part of the game with the Wild losing their composure down the stretch. We'll talk about what Jared Spurgeon did that has me irked and some of the other things that happened that are just uncharacteristic of this Minnesota Wild team. We'll also play glass half full or half empty in reaction to game one as well. My name is Seth Topal, host of Lockdown Wild, your veteran captain of the show with uh, well over a decade's worth of experience covering your favorite Minnesota sports teams and now at the helm of Locked on Wild. And we got... The game one finally happens. All of the uh, excitement and anticipation building over the weekend for the Wilds to get shut out in game one by a score of four to nothing. And honestly, even taking into account what we saw during the game, which was bad special teams play, which was a Blues team doing exactly what they had done to the Wild over the previous matchups and during the regular season. And uh, it just, it led to a lot of frustration uh, from fans watching, from players on the ice, myself. It led to a lot of frustration seeing this team go out and play the way they did. Uh, had plenty of chances, couldn't solve Ville Husso. All of that is irrelevant because really the big focal point to take from this game is what Jared Spurgeon did at the end of it. And you you look at this team getting frustrated with what happens to them yet again at the hands of the St. Louis Blues. But you just, you can't do what the Wilds did at the end of this game. Uh, I'm, of course, talking about the Jared Spurgeon taking his stick and slamming it down on the ankles of, uh, I believe it was, uh, I don't, I believe it was, Tarasenko, but for some reason, I don't think that was the case. Nonetheless, it doesn't matter which Blues player it was. Does not matter at all. What matters is that Jared Spurgeon lost his composure on the ice. That the Wilds, as a team, lost their composure out on the ice. They got frustrated with how the game had been going. and. It's a play by Spurgeon that is already being reviewed by the Department of Player Safety. And I'm sure, I, I don't know what the thought process was with what took place, but it's probably going to cost Spurgeon and furthermore, this Minnesota Wild team because the Wilds got frustrated with how the game was going on home ice, that they weren't able to capitalize on opportunities 
to try to get one past Ville Husso. And the Wilds captain, for a split second, lost his composure. And of any of the things that happened during the course of the game, that's the one I take the biggest exception to because it's one thing to lose. It's one thing to lose in any fashion, close game, blowout loss, lackluster performance. But you do so without becoming one of those teams. What did we see happen to the Wilds against the Colorado Avalanche with Marcus Felino right before the playoffs started? You see a hit where you're like, boy, that didn't that didn't look very good. And uh, that looked kind of suspect coming from the Colorado Avalanche. And then the Wild go and do it themselves. And so I went from annoyed with what happened to this team in this game. And we've got plenty of time to compress it and to try to gear up and get ready for game two, but just went too disappointed with that type of play with the game already well in hand. I, I heard something on the ESPN broadcast about the wild trying to, um, trying to kind of issue a challenge out on the ice and to kind of assert themselves with the fact that they were losing for nothing at that point. They're trying to assert themselves um, at that point in the game to so that they they don't, you know, they they don't like what the Blues are doing. And so you're trying to kind of, you know, show that that's not going to fly going forward. Well, how about you beat a team by putting the puck in the freaking net is is that is that not the goal? Is that not the objective of this game? And I I understand. It's a playoff series. It's going to be a highly contested one between these two teams, rivals in the Central Division. But send the message by getting the win in game 1. It just it comes off as like frustration retaliation. And so you look at you look at some of the fighting that happens late in the game, and the Spurgeon play, and that that stuff just that stuff just bothers me. And so now the Wild will have to wait and see what sort of discipline Jared Spurgeon is going to face, because if he is out, that's going to be a massive loss for this team heading into game two, already down one nothing, and looking at the prospects of replacing him in the lineup with Alex Goligoski, with maybe wanting to have made other changes defensively after the night that Dmitry Kulikov had. And so a team that is behind the A-ball already, down 0-1, is now going to have to keep some of that decor uh, intact for game two. And so that's the thing I think that, that stands out to me the most is it's one thing to lose, but it's another thing entirely to not l- <laughs> and I don't I don't know the word the proper wording. For it, but it's one thing to lose. It's another thing entirely to lose and not handle it well. And that is what happened to the Wild here tonight. It's a learning experience. Spurgeon is probably going to face some discipline for it. You can't do that. You can't do that in that situation. And the Wilds cannot afford to have any of that happen further in this series. They're going to have to move on and uh, try to gear up and uh, and get back into this thing for game two. So that's that's the part I think I'm irritated most about this performance. The 0 for 6 on the power play. We knew that was going to be an issue coming into the series. 
but don't pull any of that garbage late. Don't be one of those teams. That's all. So we're going to kind of get the most irritating parts of the game out of the way with glass half empty, and then we'll finish with glass half full. Uh, to recap a uh, 4 nothing loss in Game 1. More of our recap coming up after this here on Locked on Wild. Our next partner is a product I use literally every single day. I started taking AG1 because just did not have enough time in the mornings to get that multivitamin or those supplements ready, and so wanted something that was easy and quick that I could take with me on the go that is going to help my system run at its best. So what exactly is it? With just one delicious scoop of AG1, you're absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food sourced superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. This special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, and aging, everything you could possibly want. Plus, it's lifestyle friendly. Whether you eat keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, or gluten-free, AG1 is a small micro habit with big benefits. It's one thing you can do every single day to take great care of yourself. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop and a cup of water each and every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. And to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash NHL Network. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash NHL Network to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. The Locked on Wild podcast is supported in part by Jake Danielson with First Class Mortgage. First Class Mortgage is your friendly local mortgage company in Maple Grove, Minnesota. If you're looking to purchase a new home, cabin, or investment property in Minnesota, Wisconsin, South Dakota, or Florida, give Jake a call today. And if you're a homeowner, now is still a great time for a quick refinance review to see what options are available to help tap into your equity and fund those home improvement projects, consolidate debts, or put cash in your hand. First Class Mortgage is a local family-owned lender, and the best part about it is that Jake does the shopping for you to find competitive rates and programs for all of your home financing needs. With over 700 five-star reviews, Jake at First Class Mortgage will be sure to deliver first-class experience and service for any of your home purchase or refinance needs. Jake is a born and raised Minnesotan and a sports fan who would be honored to be your mortgage guy too. Contact Jake for a no-cost, no-obligation mortgage review at 763-416-6789 or email him at jake at firstclasscorp.com. Again, 763-416-6789. Make sure to mention the Locked on Wild podcast to receive a credit towards a free appraisal. Call 763-416-6789 and go wild today. Some restrictions do apply. First Class Mortgage is an MLS number is 322842, and Jake's NMLS is 202-5218. This is not an agreement to lock into an interest rate under Minnesota law. First Class Mortgage is an equal housing lender. Continuing today's episode of Lockdown Wild, once again, thank you for making Lockdown Wild your first listen each and every day. Once you're finished with your first listen of the day, make sure you head over to Locked On Sports Minnesota to check out the full range of content, including the Ron Johnson show and uh, many more things to come here uh, as part of Locked On Sports Minnesota. Wild lose four to nothing. They uh, lose the first game of the series at home and the big numbers that uh, are popping out in this game, of course, are the special teams. And what did we say coming into the series was going to be the thing that would end up ultimately deciding the outcome was the special teams. And the Wilds could not afford to play the game 
either up a man or down a man without cashing in on those opportunities. And if we start with glass half empty, I think the biggest thing to pull from this game is that it turns out the power play really was not fixed. We saw some good performances, but I, I mean, I think it was the third power play for the Wilds, and they end up getting the puck into the St. Louis zone. But you've got three wild skaters practically running into each other without being properly spaced or, or even ready to, uh, to handle the puck. And so that takes time to get that sorted out. That takes time for the wild to get themselves spaced out to where they can start to move the puck. And by that, by that point, St. Louis has reacted and is playing the puck to the point that they get it cleared out and the wild have to start from scratch. I don't know that I have ever seen a team struggle this poorly with the man advantage and a goalie in their own net. It, it just, it has been a, an issue all season. And yet we continue to have to discuss it because it continues to rear its ugly head at critical points. And not only that, but how many times in this game did the Wild have a player pick up a bad penalty after the Wilds were going to be going to the power play? You have the Tyson Jost slash that negated a penalty, uh, a power play. Uh, I think that happened in the third period. There was a penalty in which Kevin Fiala ended up picking up a minor in addition to St. Louis. That was right at the end of the first period going into the second period. Fiala had another penalty in which he picked up a four-minute. Just a lot of uncharacteristically bad penalties. Jordan Greenway had one himself. And for a St. Louis team who is as good on the power play as they are because they boast so many different options that can score on it, you're giving the other team free goals. You're giving the other team free opportunities. And then because of just how disjointed the power play unit is for the wild, they can basically do whatever they want in terms of penalties because they know that you're not going to be able to cash in on them. In order for this to even out, in order for this to... In order for St. Louis to realize, okay, we got to we got to back off because this power play is capable for the Wilds. This power play is capable of scoring. The Wild are going to have to get a couple of power play goals in rapid succession to where then the Blues say, okay, we we've, we've got to be smarter about how we play. At this point, who cares? You're you're giving a team an extra man and there are opportunities where they, they don't even get a shot registered. So the special teams battle is just through one game. So decidedly lopsided in St. Louis's favor that they're just going to continue to try to get the wilds to commit frustration penalties because that power play doesn't scare anybody right now. So that equally frustrating as to the fact that the penalty kill can't stop anybody because the blues, I, I don't know. I would hope that they were paying rent with as much time as they spent right in front of the, uh, the nets, and look at the the goals for the Blues that they scored. Uh, the one was uh, a rebound that went off of Fleury's left pad right out to the waiting Blues player who just tapped it past him. There was another one that kicked out a little further on the right side. Again, a rebound right to a waiting Blues player. A lot of traffic right in front of Marc-Andre Fleury. And... 
St. Louis knows that that is a problem spot for the Wild is giving up those rebounds in those close situations. Wild didn't do anything about it. They just let St. Louis camp out in front of the net and cash in on those opportunities. You look at, If you look at the shot chart, the heat chart, for where the Blues shots took place compared to where the Wilds shots took place, I understand that the Wilds outshot the St. Louis Blues, but look at the proximity in which those shots took place. And I'll tell you 10 times out of 10 that the St. Louis Blues had the much more effective uh, selection of shots than the Wild did. And so in order for this series, in order for the Wilds to pick up a game to win, they have to just own those areas. They have to own in front of the net. They have to keep the Blues from getting into spots where they can cash in on rebound opportunities. Because here's the frustrating part is that, yes, a couple of the goals that Marc-Andre Fleury gave up were pretty soft. But he had some really good saves in this game. It's just a lot of the shots that the Blues got on net were in the right spots for them because the Wild didn't really do anything about it to try to move them off of their spot. And so... I don't know, and this will be more of tomorrow's episode, is looking at the changes that the Wilds can make from game one to game two, but just owning that area in front of the net is going to go a long way for this team to uh, keep the Blues from, from getting those just point-blank opportunities that anybody, that I could cash in on if uh, if given the opportunity. So. That's your glass half empty, and we didn't even really talk about Ville Husso because I have seen the comparisons, and I I don't know if I want to let that, um, even though I did on Twitter, I don't know if I want to let that genie out of the bottle because I don't want the negative energy to manifest. But it certainly looked as though Ville Husso was helped out considerably by uh, the Minnesota Wild's favorite breakfast cereal, The Post. And so we're going to finish by going with the glass half full. The optimistic approach. What are we pulling from the game one loss? We're going to dig deep and uh, we're going to find some things that uh, the Wilds can, uh, can draw inspiration from. As we continue to recap a 4 nothing loss for the Minnesota Wilds, more to come here on Locked on Wild after this. BetOnline.net is your number one source for all of your betting stats and sports info. You can find all the latest sports developments, league reviews and news, including the NBA playoffs, Major League Baseball season, the Stanley Cup playoffs, and this weekend the Kentucky Derby, which is one of the sports world's most prominent betting events, all in action. BetOnline is your continued source for all of your sports wagering information, from live betting to playoffs, esports, and more. So head to their website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and the action. You can find all that and more at BetOnline, where the game starts. Final segment of today's episode of Lockdown Wild. And once again, thank you for making Lockdown Wild your first listen each and every day. Once again, a reminder that Lockdown Wild is free and available wherever you listen to podcasts. The glass half full approach from the game one loss is, and I say this tongue in cheek, that the Wild really could not have, uh, they really could not have had much of a worse start to this series than they did but you look at it and as we expected the wild did have a pretty sizable advantage in five on five play so if the wilds can actually play 
at five on five, you would imagine that the results will be different. For the Wilds, they have a couple of different things that they can do to kind of tweak the lineup. I mean, obviously, the big one is if you go to Cam Talbot for game two um, and try to feed off of some of his magic at the XL Energy Center uh, for game two. That That's certainly a, a route that the, um, the Wilds could go. Uh, they could make a couple of other lineup changes as well. Mostly looking at probably Dmitry Kulikov coming out of the lineup and Alex Goligoski probably in for him is certainly another route that they could go. Um, there were certainly plenty of op opportunities in which the Wilds, if a puck moves just a little bit this way or that, could have snuck one by Ville Husso. And it feels like, especially at home, if they would have gotten one of those first couple of goals, that they really could have turned the tide in their favor. The other ha glass half full portion of this is that it appears as though throughout the sports world, especially in the NHL, it seems like home field advantage is maybe not what it once was or is still coming back to that um it is still getting back to that uh that area um the wild obviously had a very very good home road record or a home record this year but you know, the St. Louis Blues are a pretty good team on the road as well. And so it gives you hope that the Wild can steal a game in St. Louis later on in this series. But all in all, I think the big optimism point is that the Wild have overcome adversity when written off all season long. Uh, they did that during the regular season when they had some of their worst stretches of hockey that they played people wrote them off and said this is just this is just who they are and the wild responded every single time with players out of the lineup with losing streaks with all of those things the wilds have responded every time when it's just when it seems like they are um out of answers just when it seems like the the odds for them are down the wilds have responded in all of those instances which leads you to believe that they have the ability to respond once again in this situation and whether it be Kirill Kaprizov Kevin Fiala stepping up and just taking control of the game it certainly feels like somebody in that room is going to step up and just not allow O and 2 to happen in this series. It's one thing to have sustained success against an opponent, and the Blues now are 9, or uh, the Wild are 0-9-1 against the Blues. Some, some just insane number like that in their last 10 matchups it feels like at some point that's going to have to change it's not it's not twins yankees it's not any of those others where just mentally you're like oh boy just this is just a loss before the game even starts they're very very close teams in terms of talents the wild just need to play like it and so all of the things that happened in this game, the meltdowns, the loss of composure, the bad special teams play, the one constant for the Minnesota Wild this entire season is that they have responded when adversity has presented itself. So 
I think that's the thing that has me most optimistic about game two is that the wild will get the message and will put a better effort out there um, in game two, which hopefully will lead to them tying the series at one game apiece. And so that's where we're going to leave it for uh, this one here today. And uh, now that your first listen of the day is done, make sure you uh, head over to Locked on NHL for a full recap of everything that happened throughout the NHL and Stanley Cup playoffs from uh, yesterday's action with all of your favorite Locked on NHL insiders. Locked on NHL is free and available wherever you listen to podcasts. Just like Locked on Wild, we're available wherever you listen Anytime you want to listen as well, and Locked on Wild is free of charge. So make sure that you follow along with us throughout the rest of the Stanley Cup playoffs as we gear up for Game 2 coming up on Wednesday night. We are keeping you as up-to-date on all things Minnesota Wild as possible with new episodes every Monday through Friday as parts of the Locked On Podcast Network.